Hi, my name is Steve Myers. In this video, which lasts about an hour, I'm going to introduce you to the typological theory of Carl Gustav Jung and his book, Psychological Types. Jung's theory is about the problem of opposites, or how one-sidedness can lead to productive or destructive conflict. He produced his theory during the First World War and after the breakdown of his relationships with Sigmund Freud and Alfred Adler, and he went through a sort of breakdown himself. So he became well acquainted with intra and interpersonal conflict. There are two sides to his theory. One side is very well known because it is expressed today in Myers-Briggs typology, a popular theory that was developed by Isabel Briggs Myers and her mother, Catherine Cook Briggs. This theory describes some common ways of thinking and behaving that we use in everyday life. But there's another side to Jung's theory that not many people know about. It's a theory of opposites, which explores how to resolve entrenched conflict, develop our outlook on life, and improve ourselves, our relationships, and our societies. It's called individuation. In this video, we will look at both sides of Jung's theory. We will start by examining the historical background. Why did Jung start developing his theory? Who influenced him? What, what was he trying to achieve? We'll then look at some basic principles of Jung's theory of opposites. He describes how intra and interpersonal conflict arises and he draws a link between the two. There can be many forms of opposite. Jung used typology as a frequently occurring and important example. His theory of opposites is relevant to many other forms of conflict, but we'll examine why he focused on typology. We'll then take a look at the typological functions themselves. There are four functions and eight function attitudes, and we'll illustrate them using examples from art. Up until this point, the history and theory has been shared by the two sides, by Myers-Briggs typology and Jungian individuation. In this section, we'll turn our attention to those aspects of Jung's theory that have been overlooked, and Myers-Briggs typology and individuation start to diverge. Isabel Briggs Myers saw being a personality type as a virtue, but for Carl Gustav Jung, being a type was a problem. In his book, Psychological Types, eight of the chapters have the phrase type problem in the title. In that book, Jung describes a solution to the problem of opposites. He shows how to overcome conflict within ourselves and in our relationships, and how it can drive our psychological development. At the centre of his solution is a fifth psychological function, called the transcendent function. We'll look at that function and see how it arises. A decade or so after writing Psychological Types, Jung realised his book was being widely misunderstood by readers. He found a better way to describe his theory, which was the metaphor of alchemy. The part of alchemy that relates most directly to his theory of opposites is the axiom of Maria. It involves four stages of development, and we'll take a look at what those stages are, how they relate to the typological functions and transcendent function, and how it is relevant to other forms of opposite. In the last few sections of this video, we will look at some wider issues. Jung's view of his book and his reader's interpretations diverged. This caused Jung much frustration. Isabel Briggs Myers was not responsible for that divergence, but her theory has come to represent the interpretation that Jung did not like. Myers saw that Jung had identified a problem in psychological types, but the problem she saw was different to the one that Jung saw. And she came up with her own solution, which was very different from Jung's solution. We'll look at how the two theories diverged. Jung developed his theory of psychological types with a great deal of psychological conflict in the background. He was born in 1875 into a family that had some difficulties. He became a psychiatrist in 1900 at a leading psychiatric hospital. He dealt with many patients who had been through a variety of traumas. He met Sigmund Freud in 1906 and for a few years they had a good relationship. 
However, from 1909 to 1913, their relationship gradually deteriorated and it ended in acrimony. Jung had started to promote his own ideas that were different to Freud's. He started developing his theory of typology around the time of the First World War. During this time, he also experienced his own psychological problems. But he used those problems creatively to help to develop and refine his own theory, which he called analytical psychology. Psychological Types was published in 1921. Jung didn't aim his book at psychotherapists. He wanted it to be used by lay people, but the way he wrote it made it extremely difficult to read. The first nine chapters are structured like a literature review in which he examines how previous philosophers and psychologists have tried to tackle the type problem or the problem of opposites. But the final two chapters do not contain the main substance of his theory. They are only pseudo appendices containing descriptions of the types and a set of definitions. Instead, Jung weaves his main argument into the first nine chapters. The two final chapters contain reference information only. This makes Jung's central message difficult to spot, and as a result, many readers miss the point of his book and focus on chapter 10 as being the central content. What they miss is Jung's solution to the problem of one-sidedness and how he proposes we overcome conflict within ourselves, in our relationships, and in our societies. He describes these in chapters 2 and 5. In chapter 2, he uses the writings of Friedrich Schiller to describe the problem, and he introduces a potential solution. In chapter 5, he uses a poem by Karl Spittler to provide a more in-depth analysis of his solution. He describes how the solution can be brought about voluntarily, or, if the solution is ignored, it may be forced upon the person or society through a disaster. The title of the book is misleading, therefore, because it is not just about psychological types. It is also about many other forms of opposite and how to overcome them. In the 1923 English translation, he corrects this to some degree by adding the subtitle The Psychology of Individuation. And in the 1930s, he writes various forewords and letters trying to point out what readers have missed. But these actions aren't enough, and his book continues to be misunderstood. In the end, therefore, he gives up, and he decides not to revise the book because readers don't even understand the basics of it. By that time, he had discovered alchemy, which provided a better way of explaining his theory than typology, and one that could not so easily be misunderstood. In the 1930s, his focus of interest moves from typology to alchemy. Today, the reader's perspective is most represented by Myers-Briggs typology. This version of typology was developed by the mother-daughter pair of Catherine Cook Briggs and Isabel Briggs Myers. They met Jung in 1937, when the mother was using Jung's typology to shape the characters in her novels. Isabel Briggs Myers was not particularly interested in personality at that stage. However, after seeing the need for a career questionnaire during the Second World War, she started to develop the Myers-Briggs type indicator in the mid-1940s. In 1950, Isabel Briggs Myers sent Jung a copy of her new questionnaire and asked to visit him while she was on holiday in Switzerland. However, he refused. At some point, he had come to the conclusion that lay people could not use typological theory correctly. He continued to complain about the misunderstandings of his typological theory throughout the 1950s. In 1960, he refused to provide help to a PhD student using the MBTI because it did not coincide with the purpose of his book. So what was the purpose of his book? What were the principles on which the book was based that he was complaining readers had missed? The first principle of the book is that there is a problem that needs to be solved. The phrase the type problem or something very similar appears in eight of the 11 chapter headings. Sometimes he refers to it as the problem of opposites or the problem of one-sidedness. Today we might use the term polarization. The problem is that one-sidedness leads to a breakdown of relationships and it becomes a battle 
when we take a one-sided stance against somebody else who's got an opposite one-sided stance. We not only fail to understand the other person's point of view, but we misunderstand it in a pejorative way. We see people on the other side of the argument as worse in some way when compared to ourselves. We are rational. They are irrational. We are compassionate. They don't care. We have altruistic motivations. They are selfish. And so on. And when two people portray themselves in a good light, but the other in a bad light, it leads to an intractable conflict. For example, we might want the other person to recognise their faults and change. But the other person won't accept it, because they are one-sided in the opposite direction. They see themselves in the better light, and see us as the ones with the faults. Jung looks for the origins of this division in a relationship, and finds that it comes from a combination of attitude and projection. An interpersonal conflict is often the manifestation of a conflict within ourselves between two opposites. One lies in the conscious part of the psyche and we regard it as superior. And it does seem superior because taking a one-sided approach often brings us success in life. It enables us to develop a specialism that is valued and rewarded by society. But this is also what leads to our one-sided conscious attitude because we are only fully conscious of that side. The other side lies mainly in the unconscious part and we regard it as inferior, or we don't see it at all. And in our own psyche, it is inferior because in the depths of the unconscious, it is all mixed up with various primitive instincts and thoughts. This is what leads us to viewing people who take the opposite view in such a negative way. They can carry all our projections of the primitive part of ourselves that we don't want to accept. The split between opposites, being conscious and unconscious, can take almost any form. It can be psychological, political, religious, cultural, national, or based on gender, class, race, intelligence, and so on. Opposites become a problem when one is primarily conscious and the other is primarily unconscious. Of course, we can be aware that there is an opposite and understand it to some degree, but if there is a substantial part of it that is unconscious, then by definition we don't recognise it. It is a blind spot. This was the central problem that Jung wanted to address in his typological theory. How do we overcome the split within ourselves, which, although it can bring success, also causes conflict in relationships, in society, in politics, and ultimately in our own psyches? In the index to Jung's collected works, there is a list of about 120 opposites. In psychological types, there are many more. And just like a node in a spider's web, some things can be opposite several other things. These opposites become psychologically significant when one is primarily conscious and the other unconscious. That is, we know one side of the coin very well, but we have very little awareness of the other side. Although opposites can take many forms, Jung focused his book on typology because it is one of the most commonly occurring and important forms of opposite. It acts as a good example of how interpersonal conflict arises. And to him, it was very personal. He wanted to understand why things had gone so badly wrong between himself, Freud and Adler, who was another leading psychoanalyst. When Jung started to investigate the breakdown of relations, he found a possible explanation in the philosophy of William James. James had identified two psychological types, tough-minded and tender-minded. Jung saw a coincidence between these two types and the different theoretical views held by Freud and Adler. So Jung adapted James's ideas and coined the expressions extroversion and introversion and he drew a direct connection between the personalities of the psychoanalysts and the nature of the theories they produced. Freud is extroverted, so his theory is extroverted. Adler is introverted, so his theory is introverted. Their theories are one-sided because their personalities are one-sided. 
Their one-sidedness creates conflict in their relationship and between the two groups of psychoanalysts who base their work on either Freud or Adler. The real problem, though, was that for these two men, one side was primarily conscious and the other was unconscious. Therefore, they saw their own theory and standpoint as superior and the opposite theory as inferior. They also projected these inferior qualities into each other and it led to a breakdown of their relationship. Once Jung understood the nature of the problem, he then turned to developing a solution. Although he found inspiration in many sources, two were particularly significant. One was Friedrich Schiller, who had previously argued that a third thing is needed to transcend and reconcile two opposites. Chapter 2 of Psychological Types focuses on the writings of Schiller. The other person was Karl Spittler, who wrote an epic poem that, in Jung's view, showed a couple of ways in which that third thing can be brought into being. Chapter 5 of Psychological Types is based on Spittler's poem, which is called Prometheus and Epimetheus. Jung used Schiller's and Spittler's ideas to produce his own theory of how to overcome the conflict of opposites. Jung decided to illustrate that theory using the opposites of typological or psychological functions. This was a natural choice for several reasons. Many prior philosophers and psychologists had tried to understand the personality differences between people that caused conflict. Also, psychology underpinned the conflict between Freud and Adler. And Jung could see the psychological functions in conflict within himself and within many of his psychotherapeutic clients. William James had already laid much of the groundwork on which he could build. And of course, psychology was Jung's primary field of interest and expertise. However, in basing his book on typological functions, Jung did not intend for his theory to be limited to those functions. He included religion and politics and many other subjects in his discussion. Typology is not the only application, but it is an exemplar of the theory and an important one. So let's have a look at what the typological functions are. There are four basic psychological functions that we all have that help to organise the contents of our conscious mind. Sensation, intuition, thinking and feeling. Each function produces a certain attitude that focuses on facts, possibilities, logic and values. We can illustrate the differences between these four attitudes by looking at the type of art they tend to produce. The sensation attitude pays attention to what is known, facts, reality or actuality, which are perceptions that come from conscious sources. It tends to rely on experience, be practical and realistic, use trusted solutions and ask what is real. If artists make primary use of sensation when creating a painting, they will portray a tangible reality, such as the objects, people, ambience or aesthetic qualities in a landscape. Jung represented the sensation attitude with the colour green. Isabel Briggs Myers denoted this attitude with the letter S. The intuition attitude focuses our attention on the unknown, possibilities, implications or potential, which are perceptions that come from unconscious sources. It relies on insight and looks for things that aren't obvious. It tends to be inventive and look to the future. Paintings based on this attitude will have more of a dreamlike appearance, where the meaning or content of the image is far from clear. As we look at the picture, we animate it from within our own imagination. The intuition attitude is represented by the colour yellow. Isabel Briggs Myers denoted this attitude with the letter N. She didn't use the letter I because that would cause confusion with the concept of introversion. The thinking attitude makes us oriented towards a logical structure, the objective connections between ideas and objects. Thinking organises its own ideas or the external world according to universal principles that are demonstrated to be true or correct. This type of art would have a systematic arrangement, for example suggesting to the viewer how the parts of the image connect with each other 
or with people, things and ideas that are outside the painting. The thinking attitude is represented by the colour blue and the letter T. The feeling attitude focuses our conscious mind on those people, things or ideas that have inherent value or importance. This might take the form of personal liking or disliking, or a more universal moral evaluation. The feeling attitude tends to build harmony within a particular group or between certain ideas. And it campaigns for certain causes that it thinks are important. This type of art might focus on images that are personally meaningful, such as friends or family, or depict acts of compassion or relationship. The feeling attitude is represented by the colour red and the letter F. The psychological functions can be used together in combination, though there is a tendency for only certain combinations to occur in practice. Isabel Briggs Myers narrowed the options down in her theory to two functions at a time and only in certain pairs. This means that in Myers Briggs typology there are four possible combinations and one of the functions dominates, the other is an auxiliary. When we use the functions in these combinations, they tend to produce distinctive types of art. For example, Leonardo da Vinci used sensation and thinking to create engineering designs. Pierre-Auguste Renoir used sensation and feeling to create evocative portraits and landscapes. Odilon Redon used intuition and feeling to create imaginative and dreamlike fantasies. And Salvador Domingo Felipe Jacinto Dali e Domenech, who was as flamboyant as his name, used intuition and thinking to combine symbolism and science. But not all the functions go together easily. Jung paired certain functions together as opposites, sensation versus intuition and thinking versus feeling, because there is a seesaw dynamic relationship between them. Using one of them in the conscious attitude tends to repress the other, so it becomes an unconscious attitude. If we use sensation to focus on facts, then it tends to inhibit our awareness of possibilities and vice versa. If we use thinking to focus on the objective connections between things, then we tend to repress feeling and be unaware of their inherent worth and vice versa. As well as four functions, there are also two special attitudes, extroversion and introversion. They describe how we direct each function, whether we direct it towards the outer world of people and things, or towards the inner world of ideas and information. This lady is thinking what to do next. She is introverting. But when she gets in a boat and starts sailing, she is extroverting. We can't just use one of these, we need to use both. Jung likened it to a beating heart. You need both diastole and systole. It is also a bit like your diaphragm. You use it to breathe in or breathe out. In both cases, we are adapting to the atmosphere that is outside us. We are either drawing something in from that atmosphere or we're putting something back into that atmosphere. Jung combined these two special attitudes with the four functions to create eight function attitudes. All these functions and attitudes are present in all of us. Each plays an important role in our conscious perception and decision making, and each tends to produce a different type of art. Introverted sensation brings clarity to the inner world of information, ideas and understanding. It usually involves listening, asking questions and absorbing information to achieve as clear a picture or understanding as is possible. To use the example of art, introverted sensation might seek to understand the situation in which the art is to be displayed, or to understand the meaning that the art is to convey even before the work is started. Examples of the use of introverted sensation by artists include these works, by Johann Vermeer and Rembrandt Harmenzoon van Rijn. Extroverted sensation brings things to fruition in the outer world by getting things done, making things real and producing tangible outcomes. It tends to work towards specific goals, 
using tools or techniques that are known to be reliable. In the example of art, extroverted sensing might focus on the use of colour and shape, or seek to make the image as vivid and real as possible. For extroverted sensation art, we can look at work by Damien Hirst or Andy Warhol. Introverted intuition observes the world around, but interprets it by drawing information and images from the unconscious. It uses the imagination to form new ideas or look at things from different perspectives. It explores the unknown and pays attention to what is not in the current situation. In art, it might produce images that don't seem to relate to things we see or encounter in everyday life, whereas the artist may think they do. These examples are by Hieronymus Bosch and Odilon Redon. Extroverted intuition seeks out a better world. It explores new and better ways of doing things to uncover hidden potential in people, things or situations. It challenges the status quo, breaks new ground and looks beyond the current situation to cultivate what might be. In art, it might start with something that is already known but put paint on the canvas without knowing what the final image is going to be. Or it might produce images that are oozing with hidden meaning or possibility. These are examples from Salvador Dali and Gustave Moreau. Introverted thinking provides explanations of how and why things happen. It brings structure and organisation to the inner world of ideas and information. It analyses, formulates hypotheses and gathers evidence to assess how true its explanations or models are. In art, it might produce images that demonstrate fundamental principles or truths about how various aspects of the world work. Leonardo da Vinci is an example, but we could include some contemporary architects, such as Norman Foster, who designed the Milau Viaduct. Extroverted thinking introduces organisation and logical structure into the way things are done. It establishes plans, involves people with the right skills, uses the most appropriate processes and then endeavours to make sure they are followed. With the Milau Viaduct, introverted thinking may have designed it, but it would have taken extroverted thinking to build it. Extroverted art might bring many different artists together to produce a collective work. For example, in Mike Shane's Human Sculpture. Eric Whittaker coordinated the work of more than 8,000 singers from 120 countries around the world to create his fifth virtual choir performance called Deep Feel. Introverted feeling gives importance to particular thoughts, ideas or beliefs. It is value driven, so brings a sense of importance or priority that is derived from those convictions. It brings the more significant ideas or observations to the fore and stresses them. The art it produces tends to be more focused on the human dimension. It is likely to reflect deeply held values and express significant emotions. Examples include Vincent van Gogh and Edvard Munch. Extroverted feeling seeks to promote shared values. It tries to create harmony with and within the world around. It builds rapport, appreciates the contribution that others make, looks after their welfare and tries to motivate them or make sure they feel included. The art it produces is likely to reflect those things that people feel binds them together and helps them to become a coherent society. Examples include Berthe Marie Pauline Morisseau and Gustave Courbet. To summarise, all these functions and attitudes are present in all of us, and we need to use them all to some degree to navigate through life. Sensation tells us what is there, it points us towards the facts of the matter or to what is real. Intuition tells us what might be. It makes us aware of possibilities or potential. Thinking tells us how one thing relates to another, showing us the logical connections or links. And feeling tells us its value, not in a financial sense, but whether it is important or has an inherent worth. 
each function can be used in one of two directions. I'd like to conclude this section by touching on a few additional points that Jung made. Isabel Briggs Myers believed that for each of the opposites, everybody was either one or the other. For example, you were either an introvert or an extrovert. However, Jung's view was that there were three groups, introverts, extroverts, and those in the middle. And he thought that the middle group contained the largest number of people. Also, Isabel Briggs Myers believed that your type is the same throughout life. But again, Jung took a different view. Type can change, and ultimately it can be transcended. We go beyond having a psychological type and develop a more unique and individual attitude. Another interesting point is that Jung said typology was part of the ecto-psychic system. This is the outer layer of the psyche that we use for dealing with the world. So, even when we use a psychological function in an introverted direction, it is still a way of adapting to the outer world. When we extrovert, we take action in the world. When we introvert, we think about the world. There are much deeper layers of the psyche that typology is not relevant to. And finally, it is sometimes thought that Jung defined eight psychological types and Isabel Briggs Myers expanded the list to 16. However, Jung defined these 16 types. On page 406 of psychological types, he starts to list them, but he does not complete the list. This is because in his view, even when we use two functions together, we are still one-sided. We need to use all four functions together to make good judgments. And being one-sided is the cause of many of the problems that we face as individuals and in society. We've already seen how the phrase type problem occurs frequently throughout most of Jung's book. The phrase type problem describes a state when one or more functions become developed so much that they repress their opposites. They become one-sided. A little bit of one-sidedness is not a problem and it can bring us success. If we are one-sided, then we have developed a specialism that is valued by society. But if we become too one-sided, it can create problems. This not only happens with psychological functions, but it can happen with any other form of attitude. If we have a one-sided political or religious attitude, it can lead to social unrest, conflict and war. This is because we have a distorted experience of the opposite to our own attitude and lose sight of its value. We've already touched on how differences in attitude cause conflict between Freud and Adler and how it led to the breakdown of their relationship. When we take a political stance that we think is superior, those who take the opposite stance become inferior. We think they need to be defeated. But Jung argued that the only viable long-term solution is to reconcile the opposing points of view. And we have seen that it is possible to reconcile even the deepest forms of conflict in places like South Africa and Northern Ireland. When we become one-sided, it can also have a damaging effect on the individual. Jung agreed with prior philosophers who argued that the main purpose of psychological functions is to meet the needs of society. But when we meet societal needs, it can sometimes be at a great cost to the individual's mental health and well-being. For example, Tony Hancock was one of the most brilliant comedians, entertaining millions in the early days of television. But he paid a significant price with his mental health and ended up taking his own life. Ultimately, we have to reconcile the divisions within us as well as the divisions in society. These internal splits in our own psyche can occur not only with typological functions, but any form of attitude where we take a one-sided standpoint. Jung saw the problem of typological opposites not only as important in themselves, but also as an exemplar to show us how to reconcile political, religious and cultural conflicts. Jung's solution to the problem was in short for each of us to develop psychologically 
in a certain way. We have to overcome the split within us between the conscious and the unconscious parts of our psyche. This means recognizing and reconciling opposites where one side is more conscious and the other is more unconscious. Jung called this process of development individuation. But it is not something we can easily choose to do, because this development is not about training the conscious mind, it is about allowing the unconscious psyche the opportunity to find a resolution between the opposites. The way to bring about this development is to hold the tension of opposites. This means giving them full parity, giving them equal respect. In typological terms, that means we desist exercising preference. In political terms, it means we respect those who hold political views that we find inferior or abhorrent and acknowledge that they are as valid as our own. In religious terms, it means respecting the beliefs of people who have a different faith or no faith. This approach is full of contradictions, but we have to accept them. When we stay with that tension of opposites, a new uniting function forms in the unconscious. In typological terms, this is a fifth psychological function. Jung called it the transcendent function. When the transcendent function develops, it means the basic typological functions and attitudes no longer dominate the personality. The transcendent function brings a new attitude that transforms the personality that no longer sees things in terms of one side being better than the other. The new attitude can see the values and the deficits on both sides. The opposites don't go away, they are still there. But as Edward Edinger says, we then carry the opposites. So, in summary, the potential to resolve opposites is inside us, inside the human imagination. We just have to create the conditions in which it can come out. And those conditions are when we hold the opposites in tension against each other without choosing one over the other. Under those conditions, the human imagination is allowed to do its work and find a way of resolving the conflict. The reason this doesn't usually happen is we prevent the imagination from working because we choose one side or the other. As with many other words, the term transcendent has a variety of meanings, some of which conjure up the image of a mysterious spiritual or metaphysical experience. However, Jung said there is nothing mysterious or metaphysical about it. He took the name from the mathematics of his time. Then, a transcendent function or a complex function was one that used real and imaginary numbers. In mathematics, there are imaginary numbers such as i, which is the square root of minus one. Although it is called imaginary, it is very real, and it is used in a range of applications, such as the control systems on aeroplanes. A complex number combines real and imaginary numbers. A transcendent function is a mathematical function that combines real and imaginary numbers. So when Jung used the term transcendent function, he means a psychological function that combines conscious and unconscious elements. The parallel that he sees is between real numbers and consciousness, and between imaginary numbers and the unconscious. And, as in its mathematical equivalent, the unconscious is very real. In typology, the transcendent function arises in the fourth and final stage of Jung's model of psychological development. The first stage is unconsciousness. This means we are unaware of the differences between the opposites. In the second stage, we differentiate one of the opposites. We become a type by differentiating a psychological function and it becomes a superior form of knowledge. The other side remains unconscious and our knowledge of it is inferior. And because it is unconscious, we tend to project it into other people or organizations, seeing them as having inferior qualities. Then we differentiate a second function. Then we differentiate a third function. In the third stage, we try to differentiate the fourth function. But this isn't really possible, so we have to hold the tension of opposites. And when we do that, something different happens. In the final stage, the transcendent function forms in the unconscious. At first, it produces a symbol. And as we let the meaning of that symbol unfold, it transforms our attitude 
in a way that reconciles the opposites and bridges the divide between consciousness and the unconscious. Marie-Louise von Franz described this final stage by saying, when the fourth function comes up, the whole conscious structure collapses. This then produces a stage where everything is neither thinking nor feeling nor sensation nor intuition. Something new comes up, namely a completely different and new attitude toward life in which one uses all and none of the functions at the same time. When Jung described this process, he didn't see it as a straight line. Rather, he said it involves uniting the opposites in the manner of the Caduceus. This is the rod of Hermes, the messenger of the gods. Each cycle in the Caduceus represents a splitting into opposites and then a reconciliation through the transcendent function that brings a new attitude. This is an ongoing process in which our attitude keeps developing and advancing as we hold the tension of various opposites and allow our individual attitude to emerge from between the opposites. And in later years, Jung described what happens in each of those cycles using the alchemical metaphor of the axiom of Maria. Maria Prophetissima was an early alchemist who invented various tools and utensils. Her name survives in the bain marie, a form of double pot that is used in cooking. Her axiom was that one becomes two, two becomes three, and out of the third comes the one as the fourth. The axiom therefore has four stages. The first stage of development is unconsciousness. This does not refer to being asleep, it refers to having no self-awareness and not being able to discriminate between the opposites. For example, if we were to say all politicians are the same, then we are unconscious of the differences between politicians. Also, we are unaware of our own psychological processes that lead us to that conclusion. The second stage of development is one-sidedness. We differentiate between the politicians and recognise that one side of the political spectrum is better than another. As a result, we learn more about that side. For example, if we become left-wing, we might recognise the need for more social justice. We also begin to understand our thinking process that leads to the view of that side as better. One of the problems with this stage is that the opposite remains unconscious. For example, we do not develop as good an understanding of economic competence. And when it is in the unconscious, it retains an inferior quality and gets wrapped up or concreted together with all sorts of other inferior qualities. And we project these qualities into people who are more concerned with economic competence. As a result, we project inferior qualities into them, perhaps thinking they are mainly interested in their own financial gain and lacking a sense of fairness or compassion. Similar attitudes can develop on the other side, where they see themselves as superior and the opposite as inferior. They see the opposite as over-emotional and financially incompetent. These different realities cause misunderstanding and conflict between the two sides. But the root of that conflict lies in the split within ourselves. The third stage involves becoming aware of how we are projecting inferior qualities into others and then withdrawing those projections. If we are on one side of the politics, let's say again the left, then it means we have to take a new attitude to those on the right. We have to respect the attitude they hold. Their views are just as valid as our own. We might be tempted to think they are misguided or extreme or out of touch with reality and so on. Giving them respect doesn't mean we have to agree with them, nor does it mean that there is a moral equivalence on both sides but we re need to recognise that they express their views for a reason, and it is a valid reason. And then, as we withdraw projections from the other, we might begin to realise that some of the things we find distasteful are in our own unconscious. We don't agree with it or intend it, but sometimes we unconsciously do it. Holding the tension of opposites involves facing up to the split within our own psyche, within ourselves, between the conscious part of our psyche which we can see and the unconscious which we can't. 
This presents a bit of a conundrum. How can we be expected to accept something about ourselves that we can't see and therefore don't think is true? Well, that's one of the goals of Jungian analysis, to help the client recognise the opposites within themselves. But we can do it if we want to, even though it's difficult. In Jung's view, it is a worthwhile project because it is ultimately beneficial to us and to the society we live in. The fourth stage is more complex. It involves holding the tension between the two sides. Jung argues that if we hold the tension of opposites long enough, then the human imagination will start to produce a resolution. It will develop another attitude, a third attitude that reconciles and transcends the two opposites. In politics, for example, there was one that became known as the Third Way that was adopted by Bill Clinton in the United States and Tony Blair in the United Kingdom. However, in both countries, we have to some degree slipped back from that solution and our political systems are becoming increasingly one-sided again. In summary, the model of development that Jung describes in psychological types has four stages. It involves reconciling opposites through the transcendent function. This develops and advances our attitude. It is an iterative process, so the four stages can be repeated for the same opposites to improve the degree of reconciliation between them, or they can be applied to different types of opposite. As a result of this process, our individual and unique personality emerges from between the opposites. Jung summarises how the individual attitude is developed using the analogy of a blacksmith forging a piece of iron. He said, it is the old game of hammer and anvil. Between them, the patient iron is forged into an indestructible whole, an individual. This roughly is what I mean by the individuation process. Therefore, our individual personality is not defined by our psychological type. It is not defined by one of the opposites. Our individual personality emerges from between the opposites when we hold the opposites in tension. The theory Jung presents in Psychological Types has some key differences with the popular understanding of his theory, which is now represented by Myers-Briggs typology. So how did the two theories diverge? I think there are two main reasons. Firstly, Jung buried the discussion of the transcendent function in chapters 2 and 5 of Psychological Types, which are very difficult to read. He seems to assume that readers are familiar with the writings that he discusses. In chapter 5, for example, he uses Spitler's poem called Prometheus and Epimetheus to show how the conflict between opposites gets resolved. But Jung never explains the story. Many German-speaking people may have been familiar with that story at the time he wrote his book, because Spitler had recently won the Nobel Prize for Literature for another of his works. But without understanding the story, it can be difficult to make sense of that chapter. The second reason is that the transcendent function is difficult to describe because it is unique in each individual and it evolves over time. Myers-Briggs typology is already used in a wide variety of applications, such as career choice, team building, leadership development, psychotherapy, and many others. However, Jung's theory of opposites opens up a much wider range of applications that involve reconciling political, religious, and cultural conflicts. All these applications start with our own personal development. We need to be able to carry the opposites within ourselves in order to help resolve conflicts between the opposites in the world. This video has provided an introduction to that process and the key role of the transcendent function in transforming our individual attitudes. You can find out more about the transcendent function either in my book Myers-Briggs Typology vs. Jungian Individuation, or in a book by Jeffrey Miller called The Transcendent Function. My book looks at the role of the transcendent function that Jung describes in his book Psychological Types and how it relates to alchemy. Miller's book looks at how the transcendent function is a key theme that runs throughout most of Jung's collective works.